Good morning, brethren. Good morning, sir. The scripture says that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. And he was the one that was sacrificed willingly, as he said in Philippians, that he gave up his own divinity by himself. He himself said so, that he gave up his life by himself for us. His father and himself both agreed to allow him to be sacrificed for us, that we might have opportunity to be reconciled to God. So in a sense, all the offerings and all the sacrifices that were being made in the Old Testament, and Paul alluded to this in Hebrews, when he was talking about if the blood of bulls and goats were enough to take away sins, then there would have been no need for Christ to have died. And he himself entered the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, once and for all, with his own blood, so that we can be reconciled to God. And every time they make an offering in those days, sin offering, I mentioned this in one of my messages, that God will still let it smoke. They should burn it so that the smoke will rise up to God and they will crisp it, so to say. They will burn it. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 11. Let's read the requirements, two requirements that God listed for when people give an offering to him. Leviticus chapter 2. Verse 11. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire. No grain offering. If you use the old King James, I'm using the New King James. Let me read it in the Old King James. Okay? In the King James Version. The King James Version reads, No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. For ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey, in any offering of the Lord made by fire. Now jump down a little bit to verse 13. Verse 13. Verse 13. Of the same Leviticus chapter 2. Verse 13 says, And every offering of your grain offering, you shall season with salt. Every offering of your grain offering, you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from the grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. I will read it again in the Old King James. And every oblation of your meat offering shall you season with salt, or shall thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offering, thou shalt offer salt. I will read it again in the Living. I will read it again in um, the, English, the Bible in basic English. Try to use modern translations again. Newer English again. Verse 11 of the same Leviticus chapter 2. No meal offering which you give to the Lord is to be made with leaven. No leaven or honey is to be burned as an offering made by fire to the Lord. So two requirements in our offerings, in the offerings they offer those times to God. There should be no, what? Leaven. Nothing that is going to cause things to rise. No yeast of sorts. Nothing leavening should be part of that offering. Second thing is said, there should be no honey when you're offering something to God. Do not let honey be there. So is it a meat offering? Is it a great whatever kind of offering? Do not let there be any form of yeast. Do not let that do not let there be any form of honey. No sugar. Nothing like that. That should be part of that honey, of that offering. 
And then verse 13 says there has to be salt. You must make sure there is no salt lacking when you are offering anything to God. Again, verse 13, every meal offering is to be salted with salt. Your meal offering is not to be without the salt of the agreement of your God. Without all your, with all your offerings, give salt. What is leaven? By definition, leaven or yeast actually is a living organism. Or in our time, something that might be a chemical that actually feeds on the sugars inside a substance. They actually feed on the sugar and they make the sugar to continue to grow. As they feed on sugar, they grow and they produce carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide begins to let whatever it is. It fills, it expands, and that thing begins to rise. Leaven is also symbolic of sin in the Bible. It's symbolic of sin. During the time of leaven bread, we try to take out everything that has leaven in it, symbolic of anything that actually is typifying sin in our lives, so that we can be holy before God, letting us know that we have a job. After Christ has paid the penalty, we have accepted that penalty, and we are right with God, we have a job to work to remove every form of leaven, sin, or pride from our lives. So God says, when we are coming before him, if I'm translating this into the New Testament language, make sure that you are clean. No form of pride and all forms of sin should be removed. Oftentimes, before one of the first things I say when I pray, and especially when I come to church, is to ask God for forgiveness. Because on a regular, daily, frequent basis, in one way or the other, we sometimes always, in one way or the other, we will fall short of the standard that God has set. And coming before God, cleansing ourselves, is one of the first things we must do. The priests, when they want to go before God, they will make a sacrifice and they will make atonement even for themselves before they will go before the throne of God. So when you want to go before God, or you are offering something, or you are doing something for someone, a sacrifice and offering a good deal, better make sure there is no element of pride involved in it. No element of, you know, I'm doing something really cool. I mean, this person is beholden to me. I'm pretty cool with myself. No amount of pride, should, not even a tiny one should be there. A tiny leaven will eventually grow. A little leaven, like Paul said, will leaven the whole lump. So when giving offering to God, God said there should be no amount of leavening. That is, for us, no pride and no sin when we want to come before him. Do not come before me dirty with any kind of arrogance or pride staining us or when you're doing something or giving a sacrifice because every time we do something for anyone Jesus said we're doing it for him is it not but as long as you do it to the least of this my brethren he says you are doing it what for me there should be no amount no iota of self pride inside it if it is to be accepted by God the second part says when you are bringing an offering make sure you have salt in it your offering that comes without salt is useless. I need salt there. Now, I started by saying Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Because everything they do, or they were doing, or they did in the Old Testament, is typifying something that is future, fulfilled by Christ, isn't it? Every time they make sacrifices those times for sin, and they will burn that feed, that meat, or whatever it is, and they burn it on the altar before God. It's actually pointing to the sacrifice of Christ for us in the future, isn't it? Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, is a statement that Christ made. Because, okay, it says, when you make offering, make sure you put salt there. Do not ever offer an offering without salt. I want to look at this from an angle and let us each, one by one, consider the way we live our lives. Like Paul said in his sermon, to look at the way we interact with one another, the way we interact with our environment, and understand how much God has placed on us in representing his will, 
and making the sacrifice of his son worthwhile and permanent in this world and in our lives. Matthew 5 13 says, You are the salts of the earth. Then we are the salt of the earth. And if the salt have lost its savor, then where we shall it be salted? What is the purpose of it if it has lost its savor or its favor? Its saltiness, its taste, if it has lost it, then what is the purpose? Said it is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot by men. To be trodden under foot by men. Before I go further on this issue of salt, I want to look at the second thing God said should not be in the offering we bring. He mentioned honey. And when I read and recite a little bit about what honey is used for in relation to sacrifices in the past, it seems pagan nations, when they offer sacrifices to their gods, they will actually sprinkle honey, which was then they didn't have the technology to refine and produce sugar then. So honey from the honeycomb is the sweetest substance they could find. And they'll make sure they have loads of honey on whatever offering they're giving as they're giving it to their gods. You know what that somehow signifies? And why God may have said, I use the word may loosely, when you bring offering to me, do not put honey there. Okay, Leonard, I have actually bread and egg, and I know you are probably hungry. Maybe my madam has not eaten breakfast to her children. Take bread and butter, okay? Okay, now the thing is actually tomorrow I need to borrow your bike. <laughs> <laughs> I need to borrow your bike. I have somewhere I want to go tomorrow, okay? And I, I don't have the time to enter my door and, you know, so I want to borrow your bike, but see, take care of this bread and butter. Feed yourself and feed my dad. The nations of the world will offer honey. It's like telling their God, you know, we are giving you honey, sweet honey. Wow, look at it, okay? So whatever it is we are going to be asking from you, do for us, oh, we're giving you honey. It's like a bride. I'm giving you something so that when I ask from you, you give me back what I want. God says, don't try that with me. Okay? You want to ask me something, then ask it. You want to do a sacrifice for me, then do it. And let me be sovereign. Let me be who I am. You want to ask something from me, then ask it. You want to make something and offer it to me, then do it. Do not try to bribe me. Do not try to bring something to sweeten the pot. God says, I will not have that. However, he said, we must add salt. What do we do with salt? A food that doesn't have salt, it's not as palatable. It's not seasoned. So God is saying, when you are going to offer something to me, I want you to season it. Add some flavor to it. Or to use a modern language, put swag in it. Look <laughs> so. But again, as I said, all of these things that they were doing in the Old Testament, they are pointing to something that is future, fulfilled in Christ, and continue to be fulfilled in our lives today, and by Christ in our life today. When Jesus Christ said we are the salt of the earth, He's saying we're supposed to sweeten our environment, to add flavor to our environment, to make sure that the sacrifice of his son, if Christ is the lamb of God, the meat of God, that is offered to God for mankind, for us, then we're the salt that is sprinkled on it, seasoning it, so that it is acceptable and savory to God. Which means each of us, frankly, has a very important role to play in the plan of God to bring mankind to Him 
through the sacrifice of his son. The way we live, the way we interact, our effect of one and, on one another, on our environment, on the society we live in, is supposed to show that we are the salt on the seasoning, on the, on, on the meat, on the offering. That we are the salt that is sweetening and savoring the offering of God to mankind. Typically, salt is used to form also a permanent covenant in the olden days. Salt is a symbol of permanence, to show something that is lasting, something that is unbreakable and enduring. Turn to lift to 2 Chronicles chapter 13. 2 Chronicles chapter 13. And we're going to read verse 5. Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5. It reads, Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever to him and his sons by a covenant of salt? One can give an entire message again on the, the word covenant of salt. He's saying, don't you know that God has permanently given the kingdom of Israel to David and his generations for life, forever. It's a permanent promise. It's a permanent promise that has been given to him. In the olden days, in some cultures, and I think they still do it in some parts of Europe today, when they want to wed two people, they will have salt in two containers before they join them. And then after they have pronounced them husband and wife, they will tell the wife to take a pinch of salt. They will tell the husband to take another pinch of salt. Then they will tell them to put it together into a container. And then they will mix it. And then they will pour it on the ground. And they will say that if it is possible to separate the salt taken from this container and this container, then it's possible to separate the two of you. Your union, your covenant is as permanent as a complete mixing of that salt from the two containers. Again, symbolizing the permanency of salt. Salt makes an agreement permanent. It makes it lasting. If you read things in the Old Testament, as I mentioned, it's pointing to something in the future. We look at a little parallel. And then I'm going to let us see, hopefully, the reason why the way we relate to one another, our living sacrifice to God, should be such that it actually will sweeten, in fact, let me say, it will have the qualities of salt. And I'll conclude by looking at some of the qualities of salt that we should have that should be part of our daily living and interaction with one another. Because we're supposed to give ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. And if our sacrifice doesn't have salt in it, then it's a wasted sacrifice. It's a useless sacrifice. It's possible for people to be sacrificing themselves. True. But it's possible that sacrifice could be unacceptable by God. Because it is not offered with salt, it is not seasoned with salt, as verse 13 of Leviticus 2 said. That every offering you offer to God must have salt in it. And we are the salt of the earth. And since God says we are supposed to give ourselves as a living sacrifice, it means as our walk with God, our relationship with one another. Because that's what God has called us to. John 13, 35 says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples. Isn't it? If you have love for one another. So our relationship with one another with the larger world around us is an example of how we are offering ourselves to God and it needs to be salted and seasoned 
will solve it. There should be no amount of level involved in it. There should be no honey, sweetness, or anything added to it. It should be a pure sacrifice given to God and only seasoned with salt. Let's look at this. some examples of parallel in the Old Testament that actually have fulfillment in the New Testament. And I want to use this because I want us to see that if Christ, as the Lamb of God, is like the meat offering to God, we Christians are the salt on top of that. So how we relate to the world, really, will determine how we sweeten or we present sacrifice of Christ to the world. And in fact, our relationship to the world, to one another, has an effect that is like the salting of offering that is given to God, and is therefore an agreement that is permanent, and is apparent to God as something that is acceptable to Him. Exodus 29 verse 26. Exodus 29 26. The reason I'm going through this is that while saying that all those offerings of the Old Testament and it's like Christ, you know, when they offer meat offering, that's like offering Christ. And God says, when you offer a meat offering in the Old Testament, so you must put salt in it. Well, I'm saying that if Christ is the meat offering, it's already an offering that God desires, and that He wants. That offering becomes permanent in our lives, becomes acceptable to God if we ourselves make ourselves the source on that offering of Christ. Otherwise, our conversion and our calling will have been a wasted sacrifice, more or less. Exodus 29, 26. Exodus 29, 26. And I'm going to read the New King James. You shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration, wave it as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. So when they offer sacrifices, God says, take the part that has the most meat there. Wave it as a wave offering before God, and it goes to become something that is belonging to the priest. Okay? How does that affect Christ? Actually, when Christ was sacrificed, he was woven or waved, so to say, presented to God. And that became our portion. And our portion is to inherit Christ. Is that what the Bible says? Turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verse 32 to 33. I just want to again look at the fact that Christ is going to be carried up and put before God. I don't have to go through all the scriptures. I believe we know some of the John 12, 32, 33 says, If and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This is said, signifying what death should die. Not only was it lifted up to God as the wave offering that was sacrificed was lifted up. When the offering became the portion of the priest, well, Christ also becomes our portion when we accept the sacrifice. And we are going to inherit Christ. In the story in Leviticus 16, an event that happened on the Day of Atonement, there were two goats, isn't it? The escape goat, that is the Azazel, and the goat that was to represent the Lord. The sins of the people were confessed on the Azazel. The escape goat is the Azazel, and it was led into the wilderness. That signifies Satan again. Revelation 12 tells us that, uh, 20 tells us that when Christ comes, they will take the Satan, they will bind him, and they will put him away in the bottomless pit, signifying that. But what happened to the other goat that represented the Lord? The sins were still confessed on him, but this time that one was killed, isn't it? That one was killed. If you look at verse 7 of Leviticus 16, it says, shall take the two goats, present them before the Lord, and endure the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 8. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other for the Azazel, the escape goat, or the scapegoat. Verse 9 says, Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the lost Lord fell, and offer him for his sin offering. But the goat, verse 10, on which the Lord fell to be the scapegoat, shall be presented alive before the Lord, to make an atonement with him, and to let him go for his scapegoat into the wilderness. Well, Matthew 27, 17, the parallel. Therefore, when they gathered together, Pilate said unto them, 
Who will you that I release unto you, Barabbas of Jesus Christ, who called Christ? So, in the life of Christ, there was a situation where they now had Jesus Christ, and then they had Barabbas. Barabbas was a criminal. Jesus Christ was not a criminal. And they needed to just sacrifice one. And of course, what did people say when they were asked? So which one shall I release? Of course, they said release Barabbas, and they had to crucify Christ. Again, that goat that was killed on the day of atonement was representing the sacrifice of Christ. And it was offered as a sin offering. And in offering, obviously, they will make sure there is no leaven in it, they will make sure there is no honey, but they will make sure the salt. Again, if Christ is the Lamb of God that has died for the sins of the whole world, and Jesus said that we are the salt, then our lives should be the one that is seasoning the sacrifice, making the sacrifice worthwhile. Now, understand this. The sacrifice of Christ is the sacrifice of Christ. It doesn't need us to be acceptable by God. It was designed and desired, decided, decided from the beginning of the world. Even before the fashion of the world, that Christ was going to die for all of mankind. And his sacrifices is what will bring us into reconciliation with God. However, in our lives, in humankind's version, in our in humankind's domain, that sacrifice becomes sweeting to God. If we, the people that Christ died for, live a life and become the salt that will make that sacrifice acceptable and worthwhile and permanent to God. So how do you live your life? How do I live my life? Do we have the qualities of salt? Do we have the qualities of salt? Let's look at some of these qualities then, so that we can understand that as children of God, in two dimensions, that is, in our relationship with God and in our relationship with one another. Those are the two dimensions I'm looking at. To God in the sense of how we live our lives. And therefore, as the soul that is on the offering of Christ, that is offered to God, we must have the qualities of salt. So that the sacrifice of Christ in our lives will not be in vain and it will be acceptable to God. In the way we relate with one another, we must be salt that is seasoning our old selves as a living sacrifice to God. So that we offer ourselves as living sacrifice in the way we relate to one another. It is a sacrifice that is seasoned with salt. No amount of level or price is involved in it. And there is no honey. You know God, you know I've been worshipping you, I've been following you for, you know, carefully doing all your work for the past or so, so years. So, this is what I'm asking you. I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't give me what I've been asking from you. It can help us to balance the way we respond, especially when we are waiting to God or waiting on God for something. We will not have this entitlement mind. Now, you know what, God? You know, what, what, what the, what is happening? What, what, what really is happening? I mean, look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You're not fulfilling your part. I'm giving you honey. More or less. We will recognize God is God. He deserves our worship. He deserves our very lives. And as we offer our sacrifice of living our lives for Him, we leave ourselves totally in His care. And simply try to make ourselves seasoned with salt. So that the sacrifice it's a sweet-smelling aroma to him. So what are the qualities of salt? And each of us should be asking these questions of ourselves periodically and answering that question honestly in our lives, in our work with God. So I'm going to be asking them on a personal level when I'm reaching them. Number one, qualities of salt. Salt actually signifies hospitality and is I will believe one of the key qualities of salt through time. Hospitality. When guests used to, in the olden days, when guests visit the primitive tribes, they haven't really, it took time before they learned to be sprinkling salt in food. Salt used to be in form of salt stones or cakes because they get them from places where they go and use something to break the salt out. They call them salt rocks. So when they cook food and they give to guests, they will put a plate there that has those salt rocks there. 
And the girls will take the food, put it in their mouth, take some salt, and chip a little bit out of it. If you serve food to someone without salt, it is considered almost like you don't want that person to visit you next time. It is considered bad form in some of those cultures. <laughs> Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I'm going to read verse, that means sorry, Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to read from verse 10. To buttress this aspect of hospitality. I know some time ago, I, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke, gave a whole sermon on hospitality. You'll be amazed and how intrinsic to our Christian life, God places the concept of hospitality, of making people welcome and at ease in our homes, around us, and in relating to them. You will just be amazed and shocked at how God does that, and the value it places on hospitality. Romans chapter 12, from verse 10. In this Romans chapter 12, Paul was talking about attributes of those who are children of God. And it starts in verse 9, frankly. But let me read from verse 9. Romans 12 from verse 9. It says, let love be without dissimulation, without hypocrisy. You say you do like someone. Show you like them. Let it not be I like them, but you know, behind them, you talk about them somehow. Or you say you like people, and then you still have degrees to which we show that likeness to them. Or we would sneak and snivel, sniggle at them behind their back. Hate what is evil, cleave to what is good. Verse 10, be kindly affectionate one to another. Okay, I think I'm not using the new King James. This is the old King James. Okay? Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Abhor is a stronger word than hate. Just like you can use the word dislike. That's something you don't really, you're not very cool with. Irritate. It's also something you're not so, you know. Hate, now it's getting stronger. Detest, oh, it's getting stronger. Abhor is getting stronger. Abominable. You know, God says he hates certain things. And then he says certain things are an abomination unto him. I mean, I hate them so bad, I can't even stand near them. So when they use the word, abhor what is evil, we just hate evil. Okay? And then say, cling to what is good. The word cling actually denotes something you do consciously, with effort, right? If there is a storm and you are on a boat, you know, people don't stand on the boat deck like this. If there is a rope, oh, they don't just hold the rope, right? What do people do to the rope? They cling to it. In fact, when you cling to something, you put your hands around it, you wrap your leg there, you hold it like this. They have to probably cut off your hand or remove yourself from that. That's cling. And when God says, cling to what is good, He's telling us consciously see what something that is good and do your level best to hold on to it. There will be reasons and things, circumstances that will try to drag you away. I'll give you an example in this simple statement again. Do not be weary of doing good. A simple statement. But there is a lot involved in it if you meditate on that. Don't get tired of doing what is good. How many of us here have almost gotten tired of doing good? It's like, what's the point of this? Sometimes it is in working with God directly. Sometimes it is in relating with a fellow human being. And you know what? Never again. I'm never going. But God says, don't get tired of it. So in, in doing that, I know this is good. Then let me cling to it. Even if every evidence around me, circumstances, behavior of people, how people relate, wants to drag me away from it, but I will cling to it. I will not get tired of it. Consciousness, again, in the things that we do, in working with God. 
So, when it says cling to what is good, it's something conscious. Be kindly affectionate to one another, with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. My key part here in bringing this up is in verse 12. It says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. 13. Distributing to the needs of the state and giving to hospitality. So Saul's actually denotes that level of hospitality, of doing good for people even if they don't show that they deserve it. Our evidences is, are there to try to stop us from being like that, but we choose to just do it. Salt cannot stop just being salty, is it? It can't stop being salty. Salt is by nature and a sign of improvement, so to say. So being given to hospitality, if we are like that, and we are exemplifying the qualities Paul listed in this Romans 12, then we are in salt. And our walk with God and our acceptance of the sacrifice of Christ in our life becomes meaningful to God. And our sacrifices as a living sacrifice, Romans 12 said, is therefore acceptable and a sweet smelling aroma to God. Another qualities of salt that comes out of the nature of salt. Salt is pure and incorruptible. Do you know that bitter things cannot mask salt? If you pour salt or put, take um, a wuro, bitter leaf. I learned that really. My dad would sometimes squeeze bitter leaf and put water in it and give us spoons to drink. Later I learned it was good. But when he started doing it when I was a bit younger, I don't like that taste in my mouth at all because the bitterness lingers even after I've swallowed the bitter leaves. So I will try to see if I can put the spoon without it touching my tongue or whatever and just pour it down my throat straight. For where? I will still feel that in my throat. And it lingers for hours after that. What I learned quickly is that when, it's, when I know he's calling us to come and take that thing, I will go and get salt. And I'll put salt in my mouth. So when I take the thing and I put my mouth, the bitterness is not as bitter. And in time, I realized that if you actually take bitter leaf that is extracted from with the juice and you put some salt in it, it actually makes it easy for you to actually take it. The saltiness actually tempers the bitterness. See, the bitterness does not temper the saltiness. You are going to be exposed. I and you are in the world that is not ideal. We will be exposed to conditions, situations, circumstances that will make us almost tend to be bitter. If really we want our sacrifice to God to be acceptable, to have the kind of permanence and sweet aroma that God desires, then we need to consciously remember that as salt, we cannot, we shouldn't be corruptible. What other people do should not change who you are. What other people, how other people relate to us should not change who we are. Because if it does, we have lost already. We have lost already and will continue to lose. If someone does bad to us, and we naturally have maybe a good nature, or this is how we normally like to relate and behave. And because, let me give you an example. Maybe you come somewhere, and you see someone. You do not know whether this person is older or younger. You naturally just relate to the person with respect. And because you know the people talk to you as if you are a younger person. The next time you see someone else, Last time I saw this guy, I said, oh, uh, Aunt Lagbaja or Brother Lagbaja, oh, I grew up, I would be okay, come. Um, you know, speaking talks to you as if you are a junior person. Or, so the next time you see somebody, you'll say, hey, or ever would you look okay, come. And you just change your nature. See, your nature and attitude of treating people with respect as you relate to them for the first time has been changed by that experience with that someone. Well, our saltiness hasn't shown much saltiness, quality of saltiness. We have been chained by that experience. 
There's a story that was circulating on the internet, on WhatsApp, about a coffee and an egg. Some of us might have read it, right? Coffee beans, small, and an egg. The egg has an outer shell that seems hard, but frankly can easily be cracked. Inside it is soft. And the coffee bean seems to be hard, generally. But when you put both of them inside hot water, the egg becomes what? Hard inside. The shell brittle breaks easily. And the coffee simply embraces the entire water and its aroma permeates the entire water itself. And it says, try to be like the coffee. Don't be like what? Like the egg. Frankly, that's how we're supposed to be as Christians. We are living in a world that is not ideal. We will face trouble, difficulties, and these difficulties cannot, should not change us. Our good nature, or what we know to be good and right to do, should not change because other people are not behaving to us in a way that we behave to them. And if we are like that, then that means we are actually exemplifying the qualities that Christ said we are supposed to be. The salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. I've seen people who go through difficult times. And I've had people who have experienced difficulties. And the difficulty has changed them. There was a time when a man came to do some auditing work in my office. He's in his 50s. I said, okay, you never marry. What's the problem? I said, marry him. I better go. I was still on my own. Women, hey, they should know they are devils. And I'm like, ah. You know your mother is a woman. <laughs> is she a devil? Ah. So, well, women shine. Women, I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I'm like, what happened? He had a bad experience. Terribly bad experience. To the point when it was almost two days to the wedding, the wife's fiancé just disappointed him and disappeared. Lunch, she had another person, and she was just waiting. She was really hoping that one was going to marry, marry her. But since that one wasn't really showing that much interest, she kept edging on until two days to the actual wedding of this guy was when you're down and said, you know what, I think I'll marry you. I just flashed it down and just went in that one. The guy was devastated. And I said, okay, how many times did that happen? Ah, you may actually wait for it to happen many times before I learned my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him, I said, well, this didn't happen to you once. And you made a conclusion that all women are like that. So how can that be? You've just been closing your mind and your eyes to other women that are like angels. I heard I can tell you stories of men who have done worse than what you say you have experienced. And I've seen ladies who said, hey, okay, men, hey. In fact, I wish all of them would be killed. All men would be killed. Now men are evil devils and whatever, whatever. I said, what we must realize is that people are wicked and people are evil. The world is full of evil people, men and women. But the fact is, if we allow our individual personal experiences with people to change us from how we are, we haven't really escaped that experience unscathed. We have been tainted, frankly. We have been corrupted by that experience. And God says we're supposed to be salt. And salt is pure. Nothing you put in the salt will change that salt's taste. Salt cannot be corrupted. You know germs cannot corrupt salt, right? They cannot corrupt salt. And we need to recognize that as God's children, we will face different things in life. If we want our relationship to God to be wholesome, if we want the sacrifice of Christ that we embrace to have meaning, then we need to allow ourselves to be developing incorruptibility. Not to allow ourselves to be changed 
by the experiences we go through. I'm still trying to maintain that purity, that innocence, that trustworthiness. You know, the Bible says, even if all men are liars, you know, it says, let God be one. True, true. Men, women, will always have faults. Incontrovertible fact. It should not change who we are or who we are supposed to be. And honestly, who are we supposed to be like? Until we attain the nature of the station of the fullness of Christ. When Matthew 5, 48 says, be ye perfect, as the Father in heaven is perfect, it's telling us, okay, don't try and be less like a human being and more like a tough human being. Say, be more like Christ, less like a human being and more like God. So, part of being the salt of the earth, Part of our sacrifice, our work with God being sorted or seasoned is that we do not allow the experiences we go through to corrupt us and affect the way we see and relate to one another. I know someone who has, within the body of Christ, within the church of God, for 20, for over 30 years, will look out of their way to provide assistance in whatever way possible. And guess what? Majority of the cases that has always backfired and hit that person in the face. And it's always a struggle to still be able to look at every person within that body of Christ as a child of God. That should be given the best opportunity they can be given to excel, to reach their full potential as much as possible. It is not something that comes naturally. It's a choice we have to make. It's a value system we need to embrace. It's not something that we should think, oh, it's just going to be as we are. Because as human beings, we never really will develop as God wants us to. It is only when we lean on the Spirit of God to help us that we will do so. So salt is pure and it's incorruptible. Another quality of salt is that salt purifies. Salt purifies. Germs cannot live in salt. Germs cannot live in salt. So you and I, if someone comes to you, or you see someone who is doing something that you know they shouldn't do, what should you do? Well, it's none of my business. Is it an opportunity to talk about it, to gossip about it? Is it an opportunity to keep looking at that person and think we're better than that person? Or is it we're going to be able to do what Paul said? To say you who are spiritual or think you are spiritual, to help that person to come to terms and to come back to, to the right path. Do we look out for one another to help one another be better than we are? Or do we look at one another and we just close our eyes to what we see others are doing that they're not supposed to be that it's not helping them, or we're going to work to actually improve them? Do we act? the way we relate to one another, to help one another achieve the potential that God wants us to achieve. Or the way we simply focus on ourselves without looking at how we can improve the lives of those around us. And purify them in their work with God. Encourage them to be better. Striving more and more towards the kind of people that God said they should be. Look at Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 4. I do not know whether this is done. I'm not sure it was this whether it was done in our cultures, but it seems in Israel, when a baby is born, apart from cleaning that baby, part of washing the baby, and the Israelites are very good when it comes to cleaning, pollution, and washing, save them a lot of transmission of diseases in the Middle Ages. It seems they will take a newborn baby and rub the baby over with salt. Ezekiel chapter 16 is a love story of God's relationship with Israel and Judah. God's love story with two sisters. It's the M and B. Mills and Moon. Written by God. Flowery language. Look at what it says in verse 4. As for your nativity, that is on the day you were born, your novel cord, umbilical cord was not cut. Now when you boiled in water to cleanse you, you were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloth. Rubbed with salt. 
They will wrap the baby. After washing the baby, they will take salt again. In case there are still some germs that the salt, the water is not washing away, they will take salt and use it to wrap the baby all over. I bet that will smart. Sensitive baby skin. Now, the baby will probably cry a little bit or much. But that process will cleanse that baby of salt. You know what scripture says concerning bread? Iron sharpens iron. Is it not? That is how a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And that open rebuke is better than suffering. Somehow, human beings avoid conflicts. They will not sometimes say what needs to be said. Simply because, you know, I don't want somebody's trouble. We're supposed to improve one another. Because salt purifies. Salt also makes people thirsty. You have too much salt in your diet. Or you take too much salt in your diet. You begin to be thirsty. Because too much salt will affect the imbalance in your system. And the person who will actually want to drink more water could dilute that salt. We are supposed to make one another to be thirsty for the word and the things of God. To encourage one another more to improve in our work and our relationship with God. Most importantly, not only should we be kind of salt that brings thirst, we should actually be helping to meet those thirsts. To help one another to meet their requirements and their desires for the things of God. So let us study God's word, as Paul mentioned. So let it guide us so that when a brother or a sister, someone, comes to us and needs some guidance, and they are thirsty for knowledge, and they are thirsty for understanding, we can actually make that possible by fulfilling that thirst. And the way we relate to one another should want us to be able to encourage one another to grow. First Peter 3.15 says we must be ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in us. One more qualities of salt. Two more qualities of salt. Salt enhances survival. There are documented evidence, scientific evidence in history, that during the Middle Ages, this was documented by Belgian historian Henry Piret, there was a period in Europe when there was global warming. So high the polar ice caps, as is happening around now, were melting. And the water levels, sea levels were rising. In that period, communities normally get their salt from the salt beds around the ocean areas. And they would dry and evaporate salt water to get salt. When the ocean levels started rising, the places where people go that are shallow to get water to get salt was overflowing. And people, communities were not able to get salt. And people began to live without salt in their food, in their diet. Actually, millions of those communities actually died. They thought it was an epidemic. People were falling sick, neurologic disorders, paralysis, and then they would go mad. They thought it was an epidemic of some disease until they found out it was because they have been living without salt for weeks. So not having salt in their lives reduces their ability to function properly and they behave like mad people and they were losing the use of their limbs. They were having neurological disorder. Their brains were misfiring and people died. An entire community civilization actually got wiped out. How does that affect me? And how does that affect you? Do you and I enhance the survivability of one another? Or do we deprive one another of those things that can enhance the survivability of each other? How well do you contribute to the development and the success and survival of your fellow brother and sister? And how well 
are we actually growing in God's grace and knowledge to enhance our personal survival? You know, Christ said in John 6, 63, the words that I speak to you, they are what? Spirit and they are life. So, do we grow in the grace and knowledge of God? Do we study to show ourselves that put unto God? Do we let the word of God dwell in us richly, in all its richness? Somebody asked Christ, or if somebody had asked you and I, what is the purpose of Christ's coming? We will mention probably he came to offer salvation to mankind. We will be right. He came to die for mankind so that our sins can be forgiven and we can have access to our relationship with God. We will be right. He came to show the way of how to live a sinless life. Trusting in God's power and His Holy Spirit so that we can follow His example. And we will be right. You know what Christ said in His own words? Well, at least the reason why He came. At least that was said. John 17. John 10, 17. John 10, 17. Or John... Oh, oh dear. I think it's somewhere in John 10, child. I'm not sure where. You know what he said? Is it John 10, 10? I came that they might have what? And have it more abundantly. And how can we have our life? Well, it says it's the word that giveth life, isn't it? Because the word that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So if we do not have God's word in us, we're not taking it periodically. We are reducing our survivability, frankly. Our choices, our opinions, our views of what we believe is okay or good, will be our own views. Like Paul said, it's not going to be guided by what is in the Word of God. So really, if we are to let our work with God be seasoned with salt, sacrifices we offer to God with our life to be seasoned with salt, then we'll be taking in the Word of God and we'll make sure that we are improving our chances of making it to the kingdom. And by extension, the way we work with one another and with one another, we will be looking out for how to best encourage and enhance one another to be the best we can be in this life and in the world to come. And finally, salt is heat resistant. Take salt, burn it, leave it inside fire. It will still be salt. Fire does not destroy salt. When you get home, try it. Put a put stove on fire. <laughs> put fire in your stove. <laughs> or light your stove with fire, Abby. Then take a pinch of salt, a spoonful of salt, and pour it on the burner. And leave it there. Let it burn, burn, burn. It, it doesn't change that salt at all. You can take that same salt and see you to salt your food. Nothing. Salt is heat resistant. Okay. I'm not saying if there is a fire burning across the road. Jesus said we are the salt of the earth. Run into the fire. <laughs> okay. But I will explain what I mean. Turn to Mark chapter 9, verse 49. Mark chapter 9, verse 49. Mark 9, 49 says, For every one will be seasoned with fire. The King James Version said, will be salted with fire. And every sacrifice will be seasoned with 
salt. In effect, salt, frankly, is like heat. It's a seasoning that is supposed to improve something. But also, it can also be heat that is used to make something palatable and ready for food. Under dress, people will eat raw meat. Under dress, people will eat raw fish. But even if you take food that is raw, meat, fish, and you sprinkle it with salt, it will tenderize it because they use salt as a what? Tenderizer. It will soften that meat and almost, it's almost as if you heated it slightly. You know, people will take meat, the uh, pelican, the, the um, Indians, the cowboys take meat, raw meat, and they will sprinkle salt in it and they will wrap it inside something. With the heat generated by the salt in that meat, a couple of hours they will open that meat and look as if it's been cooked slightly. Tender and frankly palatable to eat. Salt, therefore, can be said to be a kind of heat. And salt, when heated, doesn't look, it loses saltiness. And so the Bible says every sacrifice is going to be salted with salt or seasoned with salt. And it said it will be seasoned with fire. So you are offering a sacrifice of yourself to God. God says you are going to be seasoned with fire. The fire will heat the meat, but it's there, the salt is there. It will not change the saltiness that's there. How are we affected by the trials of this life? When God is trying to season us, trying to cook us a little bit to be tender, more pliable, more useful in his, land, in his hands, and actually savory, so that those who interact with us and around us and get the benefit of our lives and the correctness. Do you know that someone who has gone through a trial may be in the best position to help someone who is going through the same trial? Those who have not gone through it may not totally understand. They can try to sympathize with the person who is going through difficulties. And that's about the best they can do. They sympathize. But the person who has gone through it will do more than sympathize. They will empathize with that person. It's as if they are in it because they've gone through it. They've gone through it. It is because Christ wants to empathize with us that he came as a human being and went through all the trials and troubles of daily living. Headache, pains, abuse, insults, thirst, frustration, hunger, need, desires, whatever it is, he went through all of that so that he can be a better advocate for his father. So as we go through life, God is going to season us. He's going to test us with fire. We need to remember we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. Incorruptible. Not affected by the heat. Rather, enduring. Staying pure. Staying uncorrupted. Always maintaining our favor, our flavor. By that, we are actually enhancing our relationship with God. Our sacrifice of our work, of our life with God is enhanced, is given permanence, and of course, we are presenting the sacrifice of Christ in our lives. In a manner that is acceptable and a sweet smelling savory offering to God. Brethren, I know I started without telling you the title of my sermon. It's deliberate. I want you to be able to choose on your own what the title for this will be. You can call it qualities of salt. You can call it covenant of salt. You can call it how to give an offering, a salted offering to God. But for me, I actually call it covenant of salt. God has called you and has called me. 
our calling is without what? Repentance. Repentance. God won't change it. He has called us, we remain called. It's a calling or a covenant of salt. Permanent. However, as the salt that is sweetened on the sacrifice of Christ, that is offered to God, if we lose our favor, our flavor, that saltiness, those qualities that make that offering acceptable to God in our lives. The Bible says we are good for nothing but the trodden on that food. As we relate with one another and sacrifice our lives, give your time, your resources for others. Let us make sure we do it as a salted offering with swag beyond and above what is expected of us in a way that it's palatable and appealing to those around us. When people find you uncomfortable being around you, when people get irritated, even when you are around them or when we are doing good to them, we're losing our saltiness. Where people see no benefits in knowing us, being around us, we're losing our saltiness. When we are only good to ourselves, not to those around us. Because salt is not salt unto itself. Its effect is felt when it is seasoning that in which it is put or it is, it is sprinkled. And so our example in how we relate to one another and how we relate to God needs to be really seasoned with salt. The effect should be felt outside us, beyond us. And all those qualities I mentioned have been heat resistant, have been hospitable, have been incorruptible, have been purifying. Thirsty, making people thirsty and meeting their thirst as well. And actually adding flavor to our environment should be something we should take seriously. And when we are offering sacrifices or we are interacting with one another, let us be careful as much as we can to remove every trace of sin or pride from our good deeds for our sacrifices to one another. And let us not add any form of honey, any form of, you know, I'm doing this for you, therefore, I expect you to do this for me. That sacrifice loses its benefits. You are doing good, you are aiding someone, you are helping someone, you better just do it without any iota of pride. Without any iota of, you know, okay, this is what I'm doing, this is what you must do for me in return. Otherwise, that sacrifice we are doing will lose all the reward that you have gotten from God. And God says, if you give a cup of water to anyone, to any of these ones for my sake, you know what he said? You will by no means lose your reward. But since God expressly forbids any offering, that is offered before him to have honey or leaven. Then let's be careful that we do not lose the reward for the sacrifices offered to God. It's a bad shadow.